Hey friend, it is Chris Nolan here with another episode from our Outside the Wall podcast where we get outside of our church walls at Crossview Church and have conversations with interesting people and leaders who are outside of the church and doing stuff in the community, in the province, in the country, and in the world. The goal is for us as Christians to grow in wisdom, in discipleship, in empathy by listening to people with unique important or different perspectives from what many of us would normally encounter in everyday life. In today's episode, Chris Dirksen will be talking with Kelvin Gerksen, our provincial representative in the Manitoba legislature, the MLA for Steinbeck since June of 2003, almost 20 years. He has won five consecutive terms for political office here in Steinbeck, and he has served in the highest seat of the Manitoba government, serving as the 23rd premier of our province for two months in 2021 at the height of the COVID pandemic. He has also held a ton of important cabinet posts in the province, Minister of Health. Minister of Education, and currently he is serving as the Minister of Justice here in Manitoba. Please welcome to the show the one and only Kelvin Gergson. Hello, everyone. Chris Dirksen here with another episode from our Outside the Walls podcast. Kelvin, welcome here, and thanks for joining us on the podcast. Hey, it's a pleasure to be on with you. We look like a couple of pilots here with you know the headphones and everything. We're feeling good. <laughs> Absolutely. Hey, could you just start off? Um, maybe just let, you know, let everybody kind of know what is an MLA? Like, what do you do? <laughs> uh, that's a good question. Uh, I mean, MLA stands for member of the legislative assembly. There's 57 of us who are elected to represent. If you picture, you know, the province of Manitoba in your mind and cut it up into 57 pieces, each of us have a piece to represent and about 20,000 people in each one of those, one of those areas. And so, I mean, MLAs would do, I think a lot of the things that people would think they would do help people through with uh, with problems and challenges that they might have, uh, whether that's, you know, getting a birth certificate, you know, that might be an easy thing or or challenges that they're having with other parts of government. And then, you know, different MLAs have different roles and responsibilities. Some have house responsibilities, uh, responsibilities in the legislature. Um, I serve as the government house leader. So that's uh, an additional responsibility I have in addition to being the MLA for Steinbeck. And then others have cabinet roles, which means they're responsible for part Parts of government. I'm currently responsible as Minister of Justice, uh, and so I hold all three of those responsibilities: sort of the MLA for Steinbach, a government or a House position as government House Leader, and then a cabinet role. So it's it's busy, but I like to be busy. Uh, and uh, the most important of those roles though, was being the MLA for Steinbach. That's the role, only role I ever ran for for election, and so it's the most important one to me. Well, that's really cool. You know, one of the things I've often wondered, and I'm, I'm betting a lot of our people are, are wondering as well as they listen to this, like, what is a schedule of an MLA? Like, what does a typical week or day look like for you? It's a bit of a mix depending on which of those responsibilities that, that you hold, right? So, you know, holding a major cabinet role is, is almost like running, you know, a corporation. If you look at the Department of Health, for example, it's a $6 billion enterprise. Uh, and, of course, there's lots of people that are involved in health that are helping, uh, education, justice. Uh, these are large, large uh entities. And so for me, the, the daily schedule uh, generally is in Winnipeg. It's, uh, it's generally sort of 8.30 till 8.30 sometimes because you're, you're doing your you know, sort of political role often in the evening at receptions and those sort of things and you're running the department during the day. Um, but it's a lot of meetings. It's a lot of connecting with stakeholders, people who are involved in the justice uh, system, whether that's law enforcement or sometimes a meeting with people in the judiciary or, or lawyers, of course. So a lot of different, you know, stakeholders who have input into the system uh, and you're making decisions based on that input. And then, you know, I try to reserve a day or two specifically to meet with constituents in Steinbach uh, to hear their concerns and to try to deal with issues that they might have. Kissing babies and shaking hands, the politician. Well, uh, side I don't kiss a lot of babies these days, <laughs> but I do shake a lot of hands. <laughs> hey, would you mind one, one last little introductory question here? Um, tell us a little bit about your childhood growing up. Um, I mean, I know you're, we know you're a Christian and a, and a person of faith, but uh, tell us what kind of your growing up story and, and how you came to, to be the person of faith that you are today. 
Yeah, you know, a um, little different than people would probably expect. Didn't really have a lot of political connections in, in my family. Weren't really involved in politics before. I think sometimes people assume that that's sort of the natural path into politics that the people in your family do it. Didn't really have that. In fact, my dad died when I was quite young. I was 11 years old. Um, we were we were in the process of moving. We ended up moving into government housing. My mom raised my sister and I as, uh, as a single mother. Uh, she worked uh, full time in a minimum wage job and and managed to make ends meet, but not not in an easy way. So that was a formative time, obviously. Um, you, you know, you go through those experiences when you're young, and I don't know that you have a full sense of what impact they have when at that age or how maybe it changes you or shapes you. But I give full credit to my mom because she managed to take on all the burden and responsibility of raising my sister and I. Uh, alone, uh, but we had support through government housing. Um, I was lucky when I was 16 years old, I got a job at a place called Penner Foods, as some of the listeners might remember. Uh, it's now, of course, where, where it was where Sobeys is now. Uh, and uh, I worked there. It was my first real job. Um, Jim Penner, great man in our community, paid his employees a little more than he probably had to. And that really helped me out because it was the first time that that I had uh, a little extra money and it put me on a different a different path maybe than I would have been before. So those are formative experiences. Lived most of my life in in Steinbach. Um, really lucky to have had my mom in, in my life as that stabilizing figure and then other people who came along. And I think even if they weren't particularly trying to help me directly, but just by their own walk and their own way that they lived, um, did help me indirectly. And I would say that someone like Jim Penner through his ownership of Penner Foods was one of those people for me. So you're uh, you're firmly rooted here in Steinbach, Penner Foods. That was a big deal. <laughs> doesn't get more rooted than, yeah, than Penner get more Foods rooted. and Steinbach, right? And it, it's also <laughs> your connection with him that got you ultimately into politics, am I right? Well, not quite actually. So I I was um, when I graduated from university with my commerce degree, I was looking for you know. Uh, was something to do, but but I, I ultimately wanted to get it more into into politics, but I didn't have a lot of connections. But there was an internship that was being offered in the Manitoba legislature. You could be a, a political intern at the legislature. So I applied for that, I got hired as an intern. So that's an important role, but it's, it's sort of the bottom of the ladder when it comes to roles in, in the legislature and uh, and kind of worked my way up from there. And then subsequent to that, so I worked in the, in the government of Gary Philman, worked there for about five years or so. Uh, when Jim Penner decided to run, um, some folks around him actually said, hey, we know this guy, Kelvin Gertson, who actually used to work in your store, and uh, you should maybe connect with him. You might have some advice. So we uh, we got to know each other a lot better that, that way, Jim and I did, but, uh, but I was able to sort of support him and his political activities. But I'd been involved in the legislature before that. Oh, that's fascinating. We want to jump a little bit now into the into the meat of this and and hear and learn from you a little bit your perspective and some of your experiences as a as a person of faith in uh, political leadership here in Manitoba. And just to kind of start that off, I I was wondering, and maybe you don't see much of a difference between these two things, but would you describe yourself as a Christian politician or a politician who is a Christian? Is there a difference between those things in your mind? I think I'd probably be be trying to stay away from the label, right? Because one of the challenges, whenever you label anything, people read something into it and they try to ascribe some sort of value into, well, what did, what did you mean by that? Uh, I'm a politician who's never never been shy about my faith. Right from the beginning, I've been clear about my my faith perspective, and then I try to live that out in the legislature. Uh, and what I mean by that is is to live it out by example, right? I mean, I, I try to ensure that the things that I'm doing in the legislature, I do it in a way where people can say, okay, he's doing that with integrity, he's doing that with you know, conviction, he's doing it with honesty. Uh, and then they might want to inquire about, well, you know, what is my background and where do I come by that? And then we often talk about, about faith from there. Um, but, you know, I've been very clear about my faith perspective and then I try to live that out. And really how people label that really isn't all that important to me. And sometimes those labels become a little dangerous because people ascribe too many meanings to them that maybe aren't really intended to be there. Very wise. <laughs> Just listening to you respond reminds you of Jesus. Uh, be wise as, uh, be as innocent as doves and as shrewd as serpents. <laughs> That's mm. good. Um, you know, we just came through this lengthy pandemic. And I was wondering, I think it would just be great for all of us. I think we're all interested just to know your perspective as a, as a person who is in government. 
I'd love to ask you a couple of questions about some of that. But what were some of your obser- observations and experiences as a person in government over the couple of years of the pandemic? Well, this is a four-hour podcast, right? So I can go <laughs> on for four hours. I mean, you got to remember that I, I served um, – in, in a number of different roles over that time, education minister, I was the interim health minister for a bit. Um, I was the um, interim or the uh, deputy premier, the interim premier and justice minister. So I saw this from a, a lot of different uh, angles. I mean, my perspective was that society sort of collectively went through um, some similar things. Um, and I think one of the similar things is we all sort of lost a sense of control. And we are a society in, in North America, and I think most Western countries, where we control everything. I mean, we control the temperature in our house, and we control our finances, and we control our schedules, and we, we're, a, we're a society of control. And we collectively, at some point, probably about three or four months into that, realized, hey, we don't have a lot of control over everything. Whether you were in government or not, you felt that you were losing control of certain things. And, and, and I think that that caused a lot of reactions, and it caused people, regardless if you're a person of faith or not, to react in certain ways and 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 often that resulted in division and people being divisive um but i I think that the common experience for people is they felt a lack of control uh which is very foreign i think in in the kind of society we live in that is a that's an astute observation for sure are there anything again i'm just going to ask you some questions and we've talked about some of these before and you can feel free to tell me no i don't want to answer that um, but are there things, and I want to ask this from a couple of different sides, uh, you know, from the side of Christians, from the side of society, from the side of government, we'll start with the government side. Are there things you feel we could do better, you know, or that our government could do better or could have done better in terms of, you know, getting through this pandemic? I, I think if, you know, if we could go back and with hindsight to, I guess it was March of 2020, you know, there was a lot of uh, talk about, uh, well, we'll just sort of get through this next two or three months. And, and clearly that set a false expectation. But I don't think it was an expectation, you know, born out of ill will. I think that all political leaders, you know, wanted to offer hope and, and you know, they were listening to the advice they were getting and wanted to see this you know, end as quickly as possible. But, but clearly, I think that that set up both a false expectation and then probably also, you know, caused people to, you know, ask a lot of questions as this went on. So I think there should probably be more, you know, careful communication about not trying to ascribe a length of time uh, in terms of how long this was going to go on, because I think that that, that was, um, uh, you know, difficult to explain to people as you sort of continue to go on and then you know, people couldn't get a sense of when this was going to end or how this was going to end. So I think sometimes it's important for politicians to say, we don't know and we don't know everything. And uh, even though people are trying to give comfort. The other thing I think that would probably was a challenge was, you know, decisions are made in, in a cabinet style of government that we have. Those are decisions are made essentially behind closed doors. Government gets together, you know, they they hear different opinions, they argue these things sort of out behind closed doors, and then they come out with a common viewpoint. Uh, because government acts as one. And that's normal in our Westminster model of, of parliament. You want to have that so that government isn't sort of fractured and all over the place. Um, but members of the government get their say uh, yeah, behind those closed doors. And 99% of the time that works fine. I think in a scenario like this where, you know, there's a lot of questions going around and people are, you know, uh, impacted so heavily, being able to see the decision-making process in some way that was still within our model of government it might have been better. It might have actually given people more comfort to see that there were disagreements and not everybody agreed on everything and that these were challenging decisions and that people had difference of opinion, but you had to come to some sort of a decision. That might have given people more comfort. I've been weighing that a lot in my own mind about, you know, if you get into a situation like this, again, not necessarily a pandemic, but but can the can the uh, curtain kind of come back a little bit on the decision-making process to, to maybe help people without, you know, fracturing government, you uh, in a, in a way that it looks like, you know, there isn't a, you know, common, common sense of where you're going. Yeah. And that's definitely, certainly something I heard as well in conversations with people where they're concerned, right? Like everybody's saying the same thing. What, where's this coming from? Is there yeah. kind of some overarching plan 
Yeah, and I and I can understand that, right? Because we would, you know, people would get together at their own kitchen tables, and and families felt differently, right? And families were divided, and then they might listen to a news conference, and you know, I remember doing news conferences before the pandemic, and there was like you know five people on the line, right? Uh, and and then all of a sudden you go into this sort of situation where you're talking about schools or businesses or churches, and now there's twenty thousand people that are watching, probably just like this broadcast, right? Twenty thousand people watching, and they're hanging on every word, and they're dissecting sort of every 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 word that's being said um and and i think that if we could have provided you know um, a bit more window into how the decision making process was happening i don't know if it would have made a huge difference but it might have made some difference right so they could have seen that there were disagreements and there were things that people didn't agree on um and there wasn't i didn't agree on everything but you know you make those decisions in a in in the government you don't fight that out outside of the government but um but i can see why you know maybe the the how we make decisions uh, maybe could have been shown a little differently. Yeah, and and so what? Uh, and again, there's obviously some things here you can't share. We can, you can't be sharing specifics of what's happening in a cabinet meeting. But I know through some of my conversations with you, I've learned a lot uh, in terms of how our government makes decisions. Like who's involved? Like there's a ton of MLAs in the legislature. How do how do big decisions, for example, in a pandemic about you know whatever lockdowns, things like that. Like how many people are involved in that process and what does that look like? Yeah. So, so normally, I mean, in a cabinet sort of government, you'll have cabinet ministers who are responsible for their own, you know, departments. Um, so for example, minister of justice, right? If there's a decision that's coming out of justice, I'd be working up that decision with department officials. Officials would be providing advice. We'd be meeting with stakeholders and getting their advice. We'd finally come to a decision if we, if we required money, a monetary sort of ask of government, it would first go to Treasury Board. Treasury Board would weigh that out and see, you know, does it fit within the financial parameters of the government? Then it would go to cabinet. And then every cabinet minister, including the premier, of course, can weigh in on that particular decision. Uh, you know, on decisions related to the pandemic, I mean, you'd have medical uh, experts, you'd have other experts, you'd have those who are impacted uh, in business or otherwise coming to cabinet and describing the impact of decisions or what they're seeing, what they're hearing. And then you'd have those discussions among all the cabinet ministers, there would be lots of disagreements at times. Uh, and then often you'd, you'd involve other members of, uh, of, your, of your government or of your caucus that weren't in cabinet, but they would weigh in and say, hey, this is what we're hearing from constituents, or this is what we think the impact of this might be if we did something or didn't do something. So you had all these different sort of opinions. And you can imagine, right? I mean, representing areas of the province right across Manitoba, those opinions vary because there really was a bit of a divide between how people felt in urban urban areas and rural areas. And then Steinbeck is kind of a bit of a mixture of both, right? It's kind of urban, and but it still has a strong rural component to it. So, you know, there was a lot of mixed opinion, uh, but then ultimately you come to a consensus. But even in that consensus, there are people who had, you know, different feelings, but that's generally how the decision-making process happens. It's not, it's not an elegant process of decision making always. Um, but I think, you know, in democracies like ours, it's it's sort of the best way you can make decisions by getting input from people who represent a variety of different parts of, of the province, recognizing that there won't always be agreement on that. Yeah, it sounds messy. But I think, uh, you know, in terms of my personal opinion about a democracy, I think a democracy should be somewhat messy, not necessarily efficient, but but messy is is not a bad thing. So we've taken some time here and you've talked a little bit about how maybe government could have improved some things and stuff during the pandemic. As a, as a Christian and as a politician, uh, how, what were you, some of your observations or maybe comparisons in terms of how you saw other Christians, how we as Christians handled ourselves during the pandemic? Yeah, I mean, it's a challenging question, right? Because um, it's, it's never monolithic. And, and, and we all know those in the Christian faith there, that there are different perspectives on our own faith, right? And, and we have, even though we might all believe in, you know, in a common God, um, we have different views about like how our faith gets played out on a day-to-day -day level, let alone during something like the pandemic. Uh, and yet I saw sort of the best in people and the worst in people. And I think that we all would have those experiences. I mean, I, I think I saw people who 
were extraordinary in terms of their grace and term, trying to help other people who were feeling isolated or or going through difficult circumstances. And of course, we saw you know some of the opposite, where where people were kind of fighting with each other and and tearing each other down. Uh, and that happened in the secular community, and that happened in the faith based community. And and that's probably because we're all people, right? And we were all living a common experience, you know, probably from a from a faith perspective where we might want to take some time and uh, whether that's faith leaders or just those of us who are, you know, in the pews listening um, is to step back and, and go, well, you know, how did that go? And, 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 you know, could we do, could we do better? And what did we learn from, from that experience? And what does that mean for future, you know, our future observations and other things that we might go through as a, as a society? So, uh, you know, I would say that, you know, there was a lot of sort of commonality between the faith community and the non-faith community in terms of, in terms of reactions, in terms of division. Um, I guess the challenge for us as people of faith is, you know, should we wanted it to have looked different? Like, would we want it to have seen to be significantly different? Um, that's maybe not a question I can answer. I think it's a question we all have to ask each other, though, and and try to push a little bit to say, yeah, how, how should our faith look different when we're in times of, of crisis? Yeah, I, and I have to just totally just amen with you on it's not monolithic and and really we are all just uh, human beings ultimately and uh, so many different responses i i do wonder were there any sort of uh trends again not all christians would have participated in this but was there any were there any uh unhealthy things that perhaps you saw in 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 you know maybe not with all christians but with you know certain groups of christians whatever those might be yeah, I mean, and I had it particularly when I was acting in the in the role of the premier. I, I met with a lot of different faith communities, and and there were really different responses, right, from the Jewish community to the Sikh community, Muslim community, Christian community. I mean, they they reacted differently, uh, but I'm sure within each of those individual faiths there was variation uh, as well. You know, it did seem obviously that as time went on and as this dragged on, and I think we all felt that it dragged on for a long time, that it did become more divisive. And maybe some of those early feelings among people in faith community as well about sort of support and how do we reach out, some of that started to fall away, I think, right? Because we all became weary uh, as as this went on and, and uh, we all kind of grew tired. I grew tired as well and I also grew weary. So, you know, I think some of that might be, you know, something we need to look at is is how, how do we persevere sometimes through through things that that go on for a long time, and how do we try to maintain even if we don't agree? And and it's not always about agreeing. I mean, particularly in democracy, and it's true, I'm sure in in the faith community and churches as well. You're not always going to agree on everything, and I don't think that that's the expectation that you're always going to agree on everything. But how do you do it in a way that doesn't cause discord or cause lasting division? Um, and and that probably is you know the biggest challenge we saw, particularly in the last last year, I would say, um, of the last year of the pandemic, was that we saw that division not only take root, but I think, you know, demonstrate itself in a way that it's going to take healing for years, right? I mean, there are going to be people, I've experienced this too, there's going to be people where there's going to be, you know, fractured relationships for a very long time. That would be true in the in the faith community uh, as well. So how do we find our way through disagreement without causing it to be destructive to ourselves, destructive to our faith, and destructive to those, you know, that we want to demonstrate our faith to? Um, but in the last year, I think that we probably had a lot of challenges there. Yeah, and I think one of the things I've become passionate about is that local churches uh, not just reflect, like that local churches be hotbeds of some of that diversity rather than splitting up along political lines. You know what I mean? Where you kind of have your, your this, you know, this church is just kind of filled with conservatives who see things one way and this church is filled with, but where churches actually where Jesus transcends all of that mm. and you can, and we can actually live with unity, even if it's not all of us seeing the exact well, same and, way. And, 
And Chris, you know, we're seeing this in politics too. And it's one of the things that worries me most about politics is, and it's one of the things I've seen change really over the last 20 years is we used to be able to disagree with each other. And then we'd say, well, we disagree with each other, but it, it's not that I think you're a bad person. <laughs> we just don't agree on how this path should go forward. And I would say 99% of the time when I've been dealing with people who are liberals or new Democrats, I might passionately disagree with their viewpoint on, on how they should proceed, but I don't think they're bad people. And it helps it sometimes you get to know them in the legislature, you get to know their families, you get to know their hearts, and you come to understand that they really are you know, doing the best. We just have a disagreement on how things should go. I think what's happened in the last few years in particular, and I don't, you know, it's easy to blame social media on everything, and I don't think it's, it's maybe helpful to do that because there's probably other issues. Um, but we've gone from, I disagree with your position, to I disagree with your position. You hold that position because you're an evil person. And when you take that additional step and, and now strive motives to the individual and say, it's not just that I don't agree with your position. I think you're an evil person. <laughs> it's really hard, you know, to, to have some sort of discussion after that, right? Because now you've sort of, you know, taken your, your position, that person is, is morally uh, corrupt. And, and how do you then go about trying to have some sort of discussion or come to some sort of a resolution? And I see that in politics. I think I saw that a bit during the pandemic. And I'd hate to see that in the church, obviously, right? Because um, that's the ultimate division. It's not just when you disagree. I, I, I disagree with people all the time. People disagree with me all the time. I read the emails. I know people disagree with me. Is when you sort of go one pass, one step past that and say, it's because you're an evil person. It, it really stops the ability to, to have a discussion with people. Yeah, I think that is such a powerful truth. Now it, now you're not just disagreeing about a policy or a decision or a belief. If it's inside the church, you're, you're actually seeing this person as having evil intent, right? And uh, that's, that's something I totally saw. Did you see any, uh, one of the things I saw, maybe you saw less of this probably as a politician, but as a pastor, one of the things uh, that I'm really passionate about is, is how Christians, sometimes we can over-spiritualize things. So, and, and, and of course we want to bring God into, into everything, but how we do that, we have to be so careful. I don't, I don't know. Did you experience that at all as a, as a politician in this? Yeah. I mean, I don't know if this is, if this is what you're getting at in terms of your point, but I, but I would sometimes, you know, have people, well, not sometimes quite a bit. And they would say like, well, God has told me this, or, or, or this is, this is what God has told me. And it, it, you got to be very careful there, right? When when somebody approaches you and say, "Well, God has told me this," and if and it's done in sort of an accusatory way or, or to try to make a you know pretty strong point, the, the challenge there then, if you're on the receiving end of that, is there's there's not a lot of places to go with that, right? Because you know there's been now um, somebody has said that they've had a personal sort of revelation from from God, and you, you're not going to sort of get in the middle of that and try to question that. Uh, but there's also not a lot of place to then, you know, have a discussion. Like, where, where are you going to go in a discussion to say, well, what do you think of this? Or what do you think of that? Because now it's almost not that you're questioning that individual, you're questioning God, because God has told them something. So, you know, I think that if when we lead that way, um, it, it's a quick way to sometimes shut down discussion. Um, but of course, how you respond to that, you have to be sensitive to, because if, if people, you know, believe that this is what they have heard, then, then you're, you have to sensitively respond to that way too. But I've sort of said to folks that, you know, generally if, if, uh, if you've been given a message or be given a direction, that confirmation should come to that individual too, to whom you've had that, that message about. Um, but again, if you're leading in that way, it's really hard to have a discussion sort of about things after that. So what was life like for you and your family? And I, I know you probably can't get into all kinds of stuff, but I, I think it might be good for people to get a little bit of a window into your experience as a politician uh, in the pandemic and, and you and Kim and Malachi. Well, you know, I'm always sort of, you know, reticent some ways to talk about this because, you know, folks say, well, you know, like you, you think you had it tough. We all had it tough, which is true. I think everybody had it tough in some ways in the last couple of years. I don't think there's anybody who was untouched by this, right? So, you know, if I if I talk about some of the challenges we have, it's not to suggest that others didn't have challenges that were equal to that or greater than that, because I think everybody had challenges. You know, some of the ones that we faced, obviously, the decision-making process was difficult, Um when you're involved in those decisions, particularly if you don't agree with with everything, you know, but you need to move forward in some way. It's like, I mean, those are challenging situations. Um, you know, we we certainly, and we've talked about this, you know, publicly, and I think all politicians face this to some degree, face various degrees of threats, intimidation uh, that came our way. Um, 
you know, you try to isolate the family from that as much as possible. But some of it certainly did touch, touch, uh, you know, my family and touch our home uh, as well. So that was very difficult and challenging. Um, the most challenging, for sure, period I've ever had in my life in, in politics over the 20 years, it was by far the most challenging piece. But, but in all of that, you know, you try to stop and you go, you know, you're here for a reason, right? You, you, don't, you don't choose the time you serve or you run for election. When you run for election, you don't know what's going to come. People who've served in, in elected positions in war or, or famine or you know, depression, they didn't know that often when they ran for election. Those, those situations come up. And so you then need to do the best you can serve. You try to serve with, his, with integrity and you, and you try to protect your family and all that and show them that you're serving with integrity. And at the end of the day, people will make judgments about how you've done that. And that's okay. Um, that's part of the democracy. You ultimately have to feel good about how you've, you've done this yourself and how you've represented your own values and represented them to your family as well. But but certainly, you know, um, there was lots of pressure. And, and again, those sort of uh, difficult um, uh, threats and different sorts of things that have happened, uh, they, they impact your family more than they impact you. Because I wouldn't want to say that we sign up for that kind of thing. But but as politicians, you kind of are entrenched in that life. You're debating, you're, you're in those sort of things all the time. Your family's kind of one step removed from that, but they kind of got brought into that. And so for Kim and Malachi, it was tough for sure. Really proud of both of them though. Uh, you know, I love them dearly. You know, you know that from our relationship and, uh, I love them. Uh, I don't know if I could have loved them more coming out of the pandemic, but I think I, I admire them more for the, for the way that they, uh, they push through that. And I wonder if that some of that is to a product of what we were talking about before, which is this whole, idea of when things become personal, it goes beyond policy disagreement to someone is bad and being bad to me. Now it can bleed into this is about the person and the family and, and all of that sort of stuff. I guess that's the danger there, right? Yeah. I mean, when it becomes personal in anything, in anything that you're doing, when it becomes very personal, it's a really hard to find a resolution. It's hard to find your way through, whether you're negotiating, whether you're buying a car. Like, I, you know, I don't want to simplify this too much, right? But it really doesn't matter what you're doing. When it becomes personal and personally hurting, it, it's really hard to find, you know, reconciliation uh, with two individuals through that. Um, so some of this was very personal for us as it was personal for other, for other people. Um, but you know, we, uh, each day we, we try to, uh, find our, ourselves back to a little bit of a better place. And we really have, like I, we, we really are, um, uh, we're really strong as a family unit. We're really, really thankful for our friends, you know, coming through the pandemic. Let me like, Chris, you'll know this. We've lost some friends. Uh, uh, you know, that's not a secret. I think I said that in, when I was doing my press conference uh, as a premier. We've lost some friends, but we've made some amazing friends who, who have stood beside us through these times who we know will be lifelong friends. So we, we feel that we've uh, you know, come through this better, um, but, but also knowing that it was a struggle for, for everybody, not just elected officials. You know, one of the things uh, you mentioned in a conversation you and I had recently that I thought was was really interesting was this tension that you see operating in our society, this tension between are we getting too many freedoms or are we losing all of our freedoms? And you see people actually worrying, the same people some as worry on both sides. Could you elaborate on that a little bit? Well, it, it is a bit of a dichotomy, right? Because I think if you generally look at the last 30 to 50 years in our society, we've seen this trend toward more individualistic freedoms uh, and the ability to give more individualistic freedoms. So, you know, some of that manifests itself in medical assistance and dying, right? The right essentially to take your own, your own life, where people will talk about the right to uh, in abortion, right? About personal individual rights. We often have those sort of discussions. But on the other hand, I mean, some of the same folks will then talk about, you know, that that we're losing freedoms. And so there's this tension between, you know, kind of collective rights and individual rights. And I think overwhelmingly, I mean, we see a society that generally moves towards more individual freedom, but within there, we'll have people who will give different arguments. And, you know, that tension exists in other ways. I mean, in some ways in our society, we're, we're 
ultimately really, really concerned about you know the protection of individual information. Uh, and yet we have a society that gives more information about themselves on social media and other platforms than we've ever given before. I mean, every vacation, every supper we eat, we tell everybody everything. Uh, and yet, on the other hand, we're very concerned about the protection of personal information. So we have all these different dichotomies that exist within uh, within our life. But I, I think generally we do see a trend towards you know individualistic. Uh, freedoms and and some of that you know has consequences and some of that of course is the things that people are really looking for yeah i thought for me it was really helpful even just to hear you say that again just that there are these dichotomies it's not again the government it's there's not this monolithic trend of we're we're losing freedoms or we're gaining there's this tension right there's this dichotomy and there's this there's this uh wrestling how how is your personal faith impacted over the last couple of years as a leader in politics and during the pandemic? You know, I think like everybody, you know, it tested a person's faith. And we saw this, you know, within the broader church community. Uh, you know, we saw pastors who were leaving um, leaving the pastoral uh, profession. Uh, we saw people who were moving around to to different churches. We had people who were, you know, listening to church uh, online for the first time ever. We had people who were leaving the church for the first time ever and listening online, and some who've never you know, gone back to where they were before. So we saw this really, really mashup of, of of things that were happening within the faith community. And then I think that that trickled down to individuals as well, right? Each individual had some of those tensions as well. Uh, so we struggled for sure. I think over the last couple of years and, and question sort of things and said, well, why is this happening? Why is this being allowed to happen? How is this happening? Uh, but there came a point at some point, maybe halfway through, maybe a year into it, where we just sort of said, you know, we're not the first Christians to deal with challenges. And, and there's many Christians who have dealt with far greater challenges. Uh, and yet, you know, when you look historically over time, when you look at the lives of Christians and, and often hear about their, their walk in life, they would talk about the most challenging times also being the most shaping times for them. So it's, at some point, I think my, my family, consciously or unconsciously, just sort of decided, you know, uh, you know, God, if you can shape us in, in some way through this, as much as we're not enjoying this experience and nobody else around us is, if you can shape us in some way that's going to be better, we're willing for that shaping. Uh, and now kind of looking back on it, and my wife Kim and I just had this discussion together with Malachi um, a, a few weeks ago about we, we feel so much more in touch with our faith. We feel so much more defined by uh, our own personal beliefs. We feel stronger in what we believe. We feel more trusting in in God than we we did before. Uh, and all of those things, I think, came through a very difficult ex difficult experience. Not that we would ever wish difficult experiences on people, um, and we certainly didn't wish it upon ourselves or anybody else. But we wanted to allow it to be used to to shape us in some way, and it did. And and I think it shaped us in a better way. It's just amazing to me how often tough things. I mean, you don't wish to go through them, but you go through them and, and it can be so beautiful for your faith and relationships and family down the road. Yeah, it is. And I don't know if you can hear what my dog is going through in the yes. back when he's barking. I hope he's not going through a difficult situation, <laughs> but if he is, I hope he comes out better on the other side of it. <laughs> hey, just to shift gears here, a couple of, uh, of last questions, really enjoying this again. Thank you so much, Kelvin. Um, you know, sometimes it, something that gets thrown around a lot um, and is, is this idea in our society, in our culture by Christians of separation of, of church and state. A lot of Christians talk about this. What do you think about that? And where does that come from? And, and how should we think about that as Christians here in Canada? I mean, it's really an American doctrine, the separation of church and state. And sometimes it gets sort of misconstrued because, you know, it was intended to not protect the uh, the state from the church, but it was intended to protect the church from the state. It was in to ensure that that government didn't select, you know, one faith over the other. It was really about freedom of religion. Um, we've sort of taken it, I think, in, in Canada and maybe other places and in the world to mean that, you know, Christians or other people of faith shouldn't have any voice into government, which, you know, that they should be silent when it comes to government matters. And and that's not what its intention was. It was quite the opposite. It was about freedom of religion. So, you know, I've often said to those who don't have a faith perspective, but know that I do, that I don't have many friends. I don't think I have I could probably just leave it there. I said, I don't have many friends. I don't, I don't have many friends who would say that, you know, that, 
it should be the church that's running government. That's not the expectation. But the expectation is that they have a voice, that their views can be heard, and then decisions get made. And I think that that's really the balance. People of faith should be able to have their views heard in government, but they don't run government. And 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 ultimately, I think that the idea of separation of church and state was about that, was about that the, the church isn't running government and the government isn't running the church, um, but obviously the two have a voice to each other. Yeah. And not just Christianity either. Everybody, every individual in government brings whatever their faith perspective is. Everybody does. Everybody has a perspective in, in government on, on faith or on other things. And those perspectives, good. They may, they make for a more, you know, it's, it's in the, in the States, they call it the house of representatives. Right. And, and we have that sort of in, in parliament, the house of commons It's about people who bring all these different perspectives that then hopefully collectively make up the perspectives of their individual countries. It kind of tied to this one last, you know, sort of deep quotation marks here question so, you know, a big question in the news the last couple of months has been, you know, this this whole MAID thing and some of it's getting expanded and some of the stuff that was, you know, in the news about veterans and, and stuff like that. How should we as Christians approach, um, you know, an issue like this, which is, you know, political, but also deeply personal and impacted by faith? Like as Christians, how should we think about these things? How should we act you know, towards this or? Well, from my perspective, and, and you know, I know that there'll be others, but I, I think you sort of start by recognizing that the issue is more is, is complex and that it's not helpful if you just make things simple. I know having been the health minister that there are many things that happen in, in, in hospitals that we would never have dreamed about 50 years ago because medical science has allowed many things to happen. And those bring you into a gray area, right? I mean, what is extending life? What is preserving life? What is ending life? You know, in a medical context and the things that sometimes happen in hospitals, those are difficult and sometimes complex discussions that happen. And as more, you know, advancement happens in medicine, those discussions will become more complex and become more difficult from a, a faith or a, or a moral perspective. Um, and then I moved to the position of as health minister, I was very concerned about about doctors and other health professionals being required to perform medical assistance and dying and brought in legislation and got the support, by the way, of all parties in the legislature, the Manitoba legislature, to pass the only protection in Canada for medical professionals so they don't have to participate in uh, made for one of their patients or those in the healthcare field if they choose not to. So it's about them protecting individual liberty. And then I think going beyond that, I mean, I, I have concerns about where this is heading, and I always did have concerns that that it's moving, you know, into a direction where people are choosing uh, medical assistance and death, not because their death is imminent uh, or foreseeable, but because there's something in their life that is difficult or 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 challenging, uh, and that they don't foresee a way out of it. It feels that it's heading in that direction. I know there's been some discussion about pausing. In in that direction. But I think then as people of faith, what we're called to do is what we're always called to do is how do you how do you help people who are hurting? How do you help people who are isolated? How do you help people who feel that there's no hope? Because ultimately, our faith is always about hope. I mean, if our faith isn't about hope, then it's about nothing. So people who, who feel they don't have hope, either because their life is or their life seems to be ending imminently or because there's something else happening with mental health or other things where they feel that they've lost hope. Where can we as a faith community breathe hope into that? And I know that there are organizations even here in Steinbeck who are looking at exactly that sort of thing and having those sort of discussions because ultimately, if you're going to value life, it th that's how you value life is, is you give people support and you give people hope and you show people that you value their life, their their individualness, uh, and and them as a person. That is the value of life. That you value those people as individuals, and you want to support them. So it's it's that's my you know general perspective on May. We've got to protect those who are within the medical profession. We've done some of that in Manitoba. But ultimately, you know, I think it's I'm concerned where where it's heading uh, because I think it's becoming something very very different and very very uh, concerning. But our response as individuals of, of faith, yeah, we can we can stand up and say, hey, you know, there's a policy problem here. But our response to people as people of faith should always be about how do we help other people? Do you see uh, that same concern, you know, in terms of, 
you know, where is all of this going? Have, you know, are we going too far? Do you see that? Are there a number of other politicians provincially, federally, who are feeling that same concern or? There, there are. And I think as, as we hear more stories about individuals who are selecting made for reasons that we might not otherwise, you know, have ever or people might never otherwise have anticipated, even those who supported it originally, you know, might not have ever anticipated that that where it was, where it was going to be heading. Right. Um, because, you, you know, you want you want people to be able to feel that there is support and that there is help. And what's happening, I think, and what we're hearing, and MADE is only a small symptom of it, okay? Like, I mean, MADE is obviously the most dramatic and the most uh, impactful sort of things that we can hear about. But every day, you know, there are people who are suffering who feel a hopelessness and feel that there's no value to their life, that how can we have, how can we impact that? Now, government has a responsibility in that as well, but we're not the only entity that has a responsibility. The church and people of faith uh, and other organizations have often played a role in that in terms of how can we support individuals. Um, so yeah, there are people for sure within the political world who are many who are very concerned about that, but we need to take that concern beyond the political world and not just make this an issue of policy because the, the, the reasons that we're into this situation is because so many people have lost hope in so many situations. And if it's not the church and people of faith who can help fill some of that hope, then what what truly is our purpose? Oh, yeah, I love that. Are there any, if you could send a request out to all uh, Christians in, in Manitoba here, which there will not be nearly all of them will be listening to this podcast, but if you could send a, a plea. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> if you could send out a plea to every Christian in our province, are there any counterproductive negative things that don't help. Like, like sometimes I think, I feel like Christians, we, you know, the desire is right. Oh, you know, we want this to be better. We want that to be better. Or we, you know, we want this to be less or whatever. Are there counterproductive things that we Christians do that we should maybe stop doing? Boy, you know, I'm not a theologian and I'm not, I'm not trained in, in the ministry. So I want to be careful how I say this, because I, I want to talk about my own, I think maybe my own mistakes. I think when I was younger in particular, and I probably still do this today and I'd be mindful of this. Yeah, I think I carry my, I have in the past, I think, carried my faith as a sword and, and gone into, and gone into discussions with my Christian faith as a sword. And there's a lot of times I should have put the sword down and 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 listened to people first and and got a sense of where their heart was at first. Um, and and then shared our heart before I ever ever you know showed uh, even my own particular faith. Like like I I think you know sometimes we rush into battle because we we want to be those sort of warriors and show that this is how we're gonna we're gonna conquer and we're gonna win and we're gonna show people what we believe. But, but really, I think when you look at the life of Jesus, that's not really what he did. He kind of did the opposite. He laid down his sword. But, you know, in our society, it, it's, it's for whatever reason, I think uh, I'll go back to myself. I think I've done that too many times. Uh, and, and, I, and I put that, that, that own, you know, guilt or judgment on myself first and, and remind myself uh, more and more as I get older and, and more and more in situations, maybe put down the sword, walk in unarmed. Uh, in dealing with people and and find out where they're at and yeah maybe they'll strike you first but maybe that's okay like 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 maybe that that's part of a, you know what we have to sort of go through sometimes. Kelvin, this has been absolutely amazing. Thank you. You've given us a unique and good perspective, a lot of wisdom. I want to finish with one last question. Sure. Uh, I mean, you served as premier here in Manitoba for a couple of months. That, that's that's a pretty big deal. Um, but is there anything? Cool. One cool thing from your sort of like bucket list list of something you've gotten to do in your career as a politician that, you know, someone you've met or somewhere you've been or something you've experienced as a politician in your career. If you could narrow that down to one thing, what would it be? I can't narrow it down to one. You know, I've been so lucky. And, and, and Chris, I want to just go back to where we started this interview. I mean, you know, my dad died when I was young. He was an alcoholic. He died as a result of his of his addiction. You know, we were in government housing. Every statistic that you would have seen at that time, coming from a broken family, coming from a family of addiction, growing up in government housing, 
you know, all the statistics would have said that I would have ended up at a completely different place, not in the positions that I've held. So I've been completely blessed, and I give that that credit to God. I've been very, very, very lucky, and and I'm grateful for for all the things that I've been been given. Um, and then it would depend who you would talk to. My son would say, "Well, you met Buzz Aldrin, you know. He he stepped on the moon. My son loves space." And then he would say, "When you and you met Woody Harrelson when he was in Winnipeg filming, right? And Woody Harrelson, like he was in like the Hunger Games, and that's how he'd remember that. Of course, I remember him from from Cheer." And and uh, my my mom would say, well, you met Prince Charles not when he was king, but when he was prince, and that must have been pretty cool. And my wife loves David Foster, and she she loved going to the David Foster uh, dinner, and we got a chance to meet him and some of the performers who who were there. And and I loved going to the um, the uh, prayer breakfast in Washington. Sat beside Steve Green, who was owner of of the Hobby Lobby, was, and got to go to the Museum of the Bible. It was an amazing experience for me. The one person I remember meeting most though. And I didn't tell you this last time that we talked. First time I met most, his name was Clint Hill. And Clint Hill was the Secret Service agent uh, assigned to protect uh, Jacqueline Kennedy on the day that uh, her husband, JFK, was shot in, in Dallas. And if you look at the film, that very famous film of that assassination, there's a Secret Service agent who jumps on the back of that convertible that JFK and Jacqueline uh, Kennedy were in, and that's Clint Hill, and and Clint Hill didn't quite make it, you know, on before that second shot uh, went off, and he lived with that guilt, and you can see these sixty minute episodes of uh, from the seventies of him, you know, he was he became an alcoholic, and the guilt that he carried from not being able to stop the assassination, and I had a chance to meet him in South Dakota of all places a few years back, and he retold that story, and he probably had told that story a thousand times before, probably ten thousand times before, and you. Could hear a pin drop as he told it but he stayed for dinner after uh, he, after this event he stayed for dinner that evening i got a chance to sit with him and he was the most humble man it's a part of history he'd, he'd overcome you know his addiction he was writing books now about jacqueline king and asses he was just the most humble person and it wasn't a faith perspective but it was such an example of somebody who'd gone through such a traumatic situation and turn their lives around through that. He'd become sort of a hero in in uh, society, and was using that to try to encourage others. And you know, some of that we draw as Christians, we draw that from our faith. But there's a lot of people who do it in other ways. But it was just a reminder to me of the of the human spirit and how we can inspire others, even in our own challenges and difficult situations. And I loved meeting Clint Hill. Not the most famous person I ever met, but probably one of the most impactful for me. Well, Kelvin, that sounds amazing. Thank you so much for this interview. All the best. Thank you so much. Take care. All right. That is it for another awesome conversation. Make sure you come back in two weeks for our next episode. And again, if this show has been one that you've enjoyed and are excited about, please help us out by liking, subscribing, and sharing this podcast as more episodes are released. If you have any questions about anything that has been said in these episodes, please let us know at Outside the Wall at CrossViewChurch.ca. Thank you, and we'll see you again.